Beware, good people. The wards are failing. Dark creatures from the tales of old are returning to the world, clambering up out of the long-abandoned deepland halls to threaten the lives of the denizens of the MSF Sea. The world's great powers are doing what they can, at least those that believe the threat is real, but it's not enough. You are all that stand between the common folk and a grisly death at the hands of the abominations from below. You are an adventurer, a hero that isn't waiting for someone else to come and make things right. You've taken up sword and spellbook and you're willing to sacrifice everything to defend your world. In many cases, you're not even waiting for the enemy to arrive. You're taking the battle to them, delving down into the deep lands to slay the villains where they lay. This is the premise of the world of Atalus, a new setting for 5th edition that puts the hero back in heroic fantasy. Atalus is everything that made you fall in love with fantasy gaming in the first place. We're not running from the things that define this genre, the dwarves and elves and owlbears and fireballs. Rather, we've embraced them, restored them, and reimagined them for the modern world. We want you to feel like you've come home and then send you charging off over the horizon to discover the new wonders we've created for you to experience. Welcome to Master the Game. I am Juice, and tonight I am interviewing Mark Tassin, um, the creator of the setting, uh, Ataltus, also the game designer of that. Uh, but before I jump into that, I want to quickly mention, uh, if you are new here, please smash that subscribe button and give us a like if you uh, appreciate these kinds of videos, uh, interviews with creators uh, within the industry, or uh, if you have somebody you want to see specifically on the channel, Feel free to drop that in the comments uh, below or uh, mention it in the chat just so I can and see that and possibly get them on the show. Uh, with that, Mark, thank you for taking the time to meet with me and uh, let the audience know who you are, a little bit about yourself. Sure. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Mark Casson. I've been gaming forever, it seems like at this point. Uh, and I kind of, over the last few years, have set out to live the dream of every gamer, which is to actually get into publishing my own games. And so I started a company called Mechanical Muse. And as of this year, we've released a set of five books called for a game world called The World of Ataltus, which is our new setting that we put out. Yeah, so originally you wrote Ataltus for Pathfinder, or did the novel come first? So the first thing we did is we actually did Heroes of Thornwall for Pathfinder, okay. because at the time, you know, we would have loved to have done Dungeons and Dragons at the time, but there wasn't a, a uh, open game license at that time to do it with. Right. But Pathfinder looked promising. And so we wrote it for Pathfinder originally. We followed that up with an anthology of short stories set in the world. And by that point, we were getting a lot of demand for the actual setting itself, which was, you know, very encouraging. And uh, that's where we came to as the next step in this process. But when we actually went set out to do this, we did it for fifth edition because I felt the fifth edition just really let us capture the feel that we were looking for all along. So yeah, worked out really well. What, what made you create this setting specifically? Uh, obviously, originally Pathfinder. What made you actually create this? Was this your home game or? Yeah, so the reason I created this is that first, I've always enjoyed running games and creating worlds. And this is a world that I set out to create in part for our, our home game. Yeah. But as I started building it, what I really wanted to do was to give people one more world to explore mm -hmm. that would give them that same feeling that we all had when we first set foot in the Forgotten Realms, right? Yeah. Or when we set off into Greyhawk or Earth Dawn, you know, set off into Bar Save. You know, all of these different worlds that we got to explore, I just feel like there aren't enough of them, believe it or not, despite yeah. the amount of content. And I just wanted to give people one more amazing world that they could explore and have stories in and adventures in. And this is my contribution to that wealth of content for us and new worlds for us to explore and take a look at. When, when you sat down to do this, like, where do you begin in trying to create your world? Because I'm sure it's different when trying to write a setting as yeah. opposed to like, planning a campaign to play with your friends where you start like maybe with the town. Uh, how did you start? Yeah. So as far as where we started from, I think one of the big things that we wanted to look at is what makes a world playable, right? Because it's one thing to create a cool world and I've done fiction and things I've published some short stories and things as well. And 
It's a different thing altogether when you're creating a world that needs to be accessible to a game master and to players to play with, to have that sandbox and that set of toys to play with. Yeah. And so we started wanting to say, what are the key things that people want to do? What are the key things that these adventures are about and where is the adventure going to take the players? And then we started to build a world to that. And so that was a big part of it. The other aspect of it is we also look at sort of like a broader history because there's more going on than what you find in the Ataltus books. And with luck, this will do well and we can tell more of that story. But we wanted a story that that ties together all these different ideas. And so we started just breaking those down. And it's very complex and took a long time, but I think it was worth it in the end. It just took decades to, to pull off, right? So... So I have the PDFs and I, first of all, I just want to say they are beautiful. And if any of you guys actually want to go get them, I do have a link below to the bundle, which you can save 30%, I believe as of right now, uh, you can get all the books for it. Um, and again, they're, they're really well done, beautiful art. Uh, and there, there are mechanics in there that are different than standard 5e. Um, and he does a great job in the books uh, at specific sections and a little blurb on the side that'll say, how it's different. Um, with that, what are some of the things that are different from 5e? Maybe let's start yeah. with character creation um, sure. before we get into, say, magic, because I know magic is a little bit different as well. Well, before we go too far, I do want to point out that they are available in hardcover as well. So folks oh, who are looking for, you know, a, a full hardcover book, there you can get them that way as well through Drive Through RPG. Uh, but with my plug of the hardcovers out of the way, um, you know, uh, some of the things that are different. Uh, first, you know, we've got a different, uh, some additional, uh, we call them lineages, not races, lineages that you can choose from in the game. And so that's something that we've introduced, including a playable ogre race, playable fairies and sprites. You know, we wanted to really build out the fey world. And so we've given some of these other options, plus a number of unique uh, lineages, including the Nuwarden, which are these strange, sort of tall, thin, logical beings that are from this other realm. And so we've given people a bunch of new options, but at the same time, there's a lot that's familiar. There's dwarves, there's elves, there's humans, you know, there's yeah. the things that we look for because they just did a survey on uh, d and It was doing a survey, Watsi was, yeah. Wizards yeah. of the Coast, for people who don't know the Watsi term. I met someone who didn't know what that meant, by the way. That, yeah. In fact, uh, I think there was a conversation on TikTok a while back. Do you call it WOTC or W-O-T-C or Wizards? And like, like there yeah. were so many different takes on that. I was like, really? Nobody knows it's called WOTC. Okay. Yeah, that's why That's why I stopped myself. <laughs> Wizards of the Coast, who make the Dungeons and Dragons game. Yeah. Um, yeah, they did a survey recently, and on uh, Ian World, they did a mock-up of that survey to see what people answered there. And in the end, the most popular character races were dwarves, elves, and humans. Okay. Out of the endless list of 20-some choices, that's what people have gravitated to. Because at the end of the day, even though they're the, the ones we've always played, we love to play them, right? I mean, that's yeah. why we, we play them. It's kind of like tropes in general. I'm getting a little off topic here, but no, I really crazy. have some strong feelings about uh, classic fantasy tropes yes. and how they don't suck. What sucks is when they're not done well, yes. when they're done poorly. Uh, but if they're done well, we love them, and that's what we want to play. But anyway, I digress. I, I, I do like <laughs> being able to play the trope, but I also like being able to go against trope as well at times. Yeah. And yep. when you can do both within a game or a setting, then it's it's really cool. So it's interesting because when you talk about character creation, that's one of the things that's different in Atoltus, is that we've worked to take the idea of lineage and culture and split them apart. Because one of the things that I always disliked was dwarves are grumpy. And I'm like, well, grumpy isn't really a physiological trait, right? That's more of a cultural trait that perhaps gets passed on or gets uh, shown in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And so what we ended up doing was creating cultures. And the cultures represent where and how you were raised, those environmental factors that make you who you are. And your lineage are your physical traits. So you could have a dwarf who's raised in the Maladoran culture, and the end result is a classic dwarf from fantasy gaming that we all know they're stubborn and they're gruff and all of this but it makes sense because of the culture that they grew up in right at the same time if you want to break that you could be a dwarf raised by the chibot who are these this mercantile people who are constantly out and flamboyant and everything else well you could play a dwarf raged among chibot and you've got a completely different character that breaks every mold in the game 
And so by splitting those apart, we give people a whole bunch more options. So in the game, there are a host of cultures that you can choose from during character creation. And each of those come with things kind of like backgrounds do in fifth edition. Which backgrounds are different too in this? A little well, bit. yeah, because, you know, we have two different, to me, background is what did you do before you became an adventurer? Right. Before that day where you said, forget it, I'm not doing this anymore. What was it that you did? Were you a farmer? Were you an acolyte? You know, mm -hmm. what did you leave behind? But then what did you bring with you from those past experiences? And then you have something called a calling. And a calling is, this is why I go out and adventure every day, right? Yeah. And things like, I'm a bounty hunter, I'm a mercenary, I'm a guardian, right? A purifier, all these different ideas on why you adventure. And although all of this adds some very cool, rich story to your character and helps you to realize who they are, they also have a metagame element to them. And I this is really important to me in game design, mm -hmm. that callings give you a reason to say yes to the game master when they give you an adventure idea. So when the game master yes. says, this person here has asked you to help them save their village, every person in the party will have a reason in character to do the thing the game master has just presented because their calling gives them good reasons to do it. So if the town is being attacked by goblins, the purifier wants the goblins killed, the bounty hunter wants to collect their ears so that he can make a, a profit on the on the, all of them. The yeah. explorer wants to discover the new lands that they came from. And each person is given these things because one of the things you don't want is those moments where someone says, well, my character would never do that because it makes no sense for him, right? Mm -hmm. And that was part of the idea is that you not only enrich the story, but you add something to the game in terms of that underlying framework that makes your game run smoother and is more fun and keeps the story going. Right. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, and then if people do want to play in this setting there, you can use the stuff from D and D five E and oh, yeah. put it in there as well. So it's completely compatible, right? None of this stuff is incompatible. You could literally have one person play using D and D beyond to make their character using all the standard stuff and someone else use the options we offer. None of them break the other or imbalance the game. And that was important to me too, because I always kind of hate it when it's like, great, now we have to do everything different and I have to convert all this stuff. Mm -hmm. That's no good. The game masters don't have time for that. Right. No, nope, I, <laughs> I completely agree with that. Uh, so uh, there were some things I noticed too that were different in there. Um, some rules uh, mm -hmm. changes and adjustments. Um, for instance, I noted before we went on stream, like the shield uh, as a reaction. Um, mm -hmm. which I really like that idea, that concept that you actually have to give up your reaction to block. Um, yeah. So yeah. Can you elaborate on maybe some other things like that, that were also, uh, you know, the biggest thing is going to be the magic, the arcane yeah. magic system. And one of the things that I always disliked about some of the most recent incarnations is that arcane magic and divine magic felt like the same thing, right? right. I didn't sit there and go, this person's a cleric and you can feel it. And this person is an arcane caster. I also really liked the idea of magic being somewhat terrifying. Yeah. That it's useful and you're going to use it anyway, but in the back of your mind, you're, it's kind of like nuclear power, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, it's really good, but God, do, do I really feel okay with it? And that's the sense I wanted to have. And for a few reasons, one, to get rid of that old argument of, well, if there was magic, why wouldn't they do everything with magic? Well, part of the reason why is that it's a little bit dangerous. And the way we reflect this yes. in the game, yeah, and the way we reflect this in the game is that magic is skill-based, right? You're making a spell casting role when you're trying to cast a spell, it's an arcane spell caster. That's based on the difficult, the level of the spell and your proficiency and all these things come into play. And on a critical failure, things go critically wrong right? You end up with some just absolutely, uh, it can start from very minor things to there's a burst of light instead of the fireball you set out to cast yeah. to you open a rift in space and are sucked into it, you know, and <laughs> that's the end of that. And when you have that as a potential outcome, when you go to someone and say, would you like me to magically light your fire? They're like, no, I will just use flint and steel. I'm good. <laughs> it's not worth the risk. Um, but with this system, there's also point based because one of the things that I really like the idea of is a spell caster that would have a little more control over what spells they cast when. Yeah. So that you could have the, have the ability to cast a spell from a book. So you have that classic moment where you find a book in the dungeon and you're like, 
I'm going to cast a spell right now and see if I can figure it out. Mm -hmm. And also the idea of pushing a little bit too far. So when you run out of spell points, you're like, well, I could just burn some hit points, but do I really want to do that? Because if the spell goes wrong and then it costs double, I could be in really big trouble. And we've seen that happen in our Atalthus games, right? <laughs> and so all of those things are very fun. It lets you cast spells at a higher level than you should. See, that right? part it, stood out to me too. I was like, oh, you can upcast beyond your level, but it's diff like more difficult. I really like yeah. that idea. Like it's totally more taxing and, yep. And you're more likely to have it go wrong, right? Right. So you, everyone says, dude, we need you to cast that fireball. And the guy's going, I'm first level. This is not going <laughs> to end well. They're like, yeah, or we all die. So what are you going to do? So yep. yeah, we're, that was always really fun. And in play testing, we always had fun with that. And at conventions, we always had fun with that as well. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's good on so, and the other thing I will say that's kind of fun about that, is, and you get me talking about this and I have a hard time stopping, so you'll have to cut me <laughs> off. You know, we have things like essence wells and ley lines. And because it's a point-based magic system, you have arcane spell caches that can tap into these to draw power from them. And it creates all these great ideas like dragons that make their homes on top of essence wells because they can draw that energy in. You know, it, it just opens up all sorts of doors. But like the other stuff, Someone could play a standard D&D wizard or sorcerer or warlock, and they are completely balanced, right? Because it's based yeah. off the mathematically, I very nerdily went through and made sure that it worked as a balanced level. And we actually play tested this and yeah, it works well, right? You can have the two things going side by side and it really doesn't break anything. Right. Yeah, I, uh, I am a someone who got into tabletop RPGs through Palladium books and riffs. And so mm -hmm. like ley lines and stuff is a pretty big deal in that. And yeah. actually I know some of the people in the chat right now also are big uh, Palladium fans. Uh, so hearing that there's ley lines and, and that might has an impact on the game itself uh, might interest them as well because, oh, um, very cool. because of all that. Um, so the setting itself, um, I, the map I saw, it looks like it's just uh, like one big inner sea region. Uh, mm -hmm. and then like just the lands around it. Is that the, the whole setting right there? So the primary area that we've explored in these books, mm -hmm. and which is going to be the sort of the core location, is a place called the Amethyst Sea. Yes. And the Amethyst Sea is about the length east to west of the Mediterranean. And that was, you know, partly on purpose, because that way when you're looking at it, you have a real world thing you can compare it to. As a game yes. master, I always like, when someone goes, how far is it? And you look at it and go, I don't know, right? But if you're like, well, the Mediterranean would be about this big. And I have a, I've studied way more history than I need to. So, um, but anyway, it, it has uh, nations all the way around it, right? Different yeah, people yeah. have settled in different areas. Most of these are mixed lineage, right? We're not talking, mm -hmm. it, there are a few. There's the dwarven uh, land of Malador, which is primarily dwarves only because the dwarves founded it and that is before the coming of the Atlan, which we can talk about at some point, which is a bit of an uh, interesting thing about the setting. But there's this, the, all the way around, you've got a jungle in the far south, the Zeman jungle, which is this lush jungle that is filled, it's this sort of Amazonian density with a 3,000 foot cliff wall at the far south mm -hmm. side of it that um you know it's just covered with caves and caverns and things like that no one can quite get close to them you've got the Elian wilds off to the east which is a magically warped forest from a, a elven queen who had in her mind that she wanted to be a god and it did not go well right yeah, because yeah. the elven queens are tied to the land when the spell went wrong it went very wrong and now you've got the magical Elian wilds. You've got the Sith and Waste to the south, which is this desert land that used to be a lush land. And now we have this sort of reptilian, almost um, Saurian race that lives in this desert land, the Sith. Ah. I love it. You know, up to like you know, the Icebound Plains. So the Icebound Plains, you know, the icy north of the Droth Mall live in their nomadic bands. And, you know, all the things that you look for. But my hope, and this is what we've actually heard from people, is that it feels really new. And yet at the same time, they're like going, but I get it, right? It yeah, hits yeah. those notes that we're looking for, you know? So hopefully, you know, it seems like it's working pretty well so far. But uh, yeah, so that, that's the general setting is this, this sort of inland sea. So it also gives you a nice sort of controlled space. And it probably will look to most people like a meteor strike. So 
It kind of does it look is, like that. But it kind of looks like that. Yeah. It, it, I have to tell you that I actually talked to a, uh, a professor of geology and had him review our entire world map yeah. and critique all the way that it was set up and whether or not things like that 3,000 foot cliff and all the rest were at all viable. And <laughs> he went through and corrected things. And so as, as a nerd, I needed to know that it was possible that this thing could exist. So, oh, that's cool. That is yeah. cool that like, because my homebrew world, I have not done that kind of research. <laughs> like, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just like, all right, this sounds cool over here. Like, I try to put some of my own logic behind it, but I haven't studied a lot of the stuff, you know. Um, and then I obviously it's a fantasy world, so I can always defy realism anyway, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, that's really cool that you've put that much thought and effort. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was fun. I mean, to me, that's what I look for. And yeah. when I know that that stuff is there in a game, I love it, right? Yeah. So I wanted to give that to everybody else. And some people who have studied these things, like maybe they went to college for it or they have a fascination mm -hmm. with it, that could be the difference of taking them out of the setting and loving it or not liking it, too. You know, if yeah. it's not realistic at all, some people, that bothers them, so... So that's awesome. I learned a lot from having a symbol engineer play with us for years in our group. And he said, you realize how steep that slope is. And I went, oh, come on, man. <laughs> but it struck me that those are, like you said, that can throw people out. Right? Yeah, for but sure. it's, I mean, still, there, there is some hand waving, right? It's still fantasy. The story comes first. The, the fun yeah. comes first. But for I try sure. to have that underpinning, like the medieval pricing system that I came up with, you know. Yes. Yeah. That Because I noticed that too, like the difference between the, the gold, you said you try to re recreate like European medieval times currency rather than like D&D &D currency. Well, yeah, what I ended up doing was I and I wanted to talk about this because quite a few people have gone, ooh, I like this part. It's that I studied late 13th and early 14th century prices. Okay. I pulled a bunch of original source material, including tax rolls and things from Scotland and England and France. And I went through and like the crazy person I am, I wrote down every single item that was listed and how much it was and created this mother of all databases. And I went through and developed a system that I could then use to, to sort of represent what the difference of wealth and cost would be. And you end up with some things that are much cheaper that sort of surprise you, like swords are... Yeah. Uh, average short, short sword is not expensive in the medieval world. Right. Because it was common. It, it was very common to slap yeah, out the metal into a sword. Exactly. Sword. Like for a basic, they call it a peasant sword, right? Yep. I think it's like six silver pieces or something because we use silver instead of gold base. Yeah. Um, and then a blanket, however, is very expensive, right? And it's sort of like because all the time of things, and effort. Yeah. Exactly. And it adds to the story where all of a sudden the character is like, I fold up my blanket and put it in my my backpack before we go because I don't want to have to buy another one, right? And all <laughs> right. of a sudden the story takes on this element of reality that wouldn't have been there otherwise, right? So, yeah. I mean, that's part of what I wanted. It also puts a bigger gap between the nobility yeah. and those who aren't the nobility. And I think that that's important too to creating that mm -hmm. environment that we all want to sort of represent in our games. Yes. Yeah, I, we have a, a, a player in one of my games, his character is very into like high thread count sheets. Like any chance he can get something real fancy, he's grabbing it every chance he gets. It's it's really funny. Yeah. Um, so we did get a question uh, before we get too far away from the magic. Yeah. Uh, if you do cast something higher level, can there mm -hmm. be consequence, consequences for doing so? And I believe we kind of touched on that. Uh, stating that yeah. it's more difficult and your mishap table, uh, you're more likely to trigger. But um, is there anything other than that that you want to add to it? Yeah, I think the, the biggest challenge you have is that if you're casting something higher level, it's more difficult. Mm -hmm. It often takes more time. You might have to have more mitigating factors, like you probably have to have the book out in front of you in most yeah. cases, right? It depends on the situation. But these are the sorts of things that come into play to try to pull off something like that. You're not just going to fire it off. There's right. also the cost involved, right? Mm -hmm. And when you're low enough level, some of those spells, it's kind of dangerous to cast it because a, a relatively common mishap is you end up doubling the cost, right? right? Which is all well and good if you've got plenty of points. But if you're second level and you don't have a whole lot of essence points, mm -hmm. once you run out, it comes off your hit points. Oof. And so every essence point is a hit point. Now, you can do this on purpose as well if you're out of essence points and desperate. Yeah. But the whole idea is that 
uh, each person has this sort of essence form that is their spirit. And instead of drawing from your well of essence that's stored inside there, you're actually tearing apart the threads of that essence form to cast the spell. Mm -hmm. And so those are some of the dangers that exist when you're trying to do these sorts of things. So. Yikes. Interesting. Uh, so what, in your opinion, was the the most difficult part of coming up with this setting? Like, what was the, maybe it was an area or maybe even the mechanics? Like, what was the most difficult part for you? You know, the thing I think that was the most difficult was trying to, you know, our mission of creating a world that contained the things that everybody loves and everyone that made us fall in love with fantasy settings. Yeah. And yet making it feel new and different and like a place you've never been before. And, you know, that was the toughest part. I think we spent the most time on that saying, that's not quite there. We got to tune it just a little bit to get that feel where someone yeah. doesn't even realize why it is that they like it or are familiar with it. And yet it feels like a, a whole new world, like the, right. the whole dwarves and their deep winds and being cast out of the deep winds. So you've got this setting where things get more dangerous as you go farther down and there's dwarven ruins under the ground. But why are they there? And what's the story that puts them there? And how do you make sure that that story drives the game and feels like a new story that you haven't heard before without being so out there that you're like, oh, it's dwarves who are sailors who hate caves right yeah you know? it's like oh we just flipped the trope upside down like <laughs> yeah so it's, i mean i'm okay with doing so and of i that, do it all I, the time in my games but well yeah and, i mean in the southeast there's the the blade sea which is this yeah. big open plain and dwarves have ships that they put wheels on and they use them to sail across the blade mm -hmm. sea so there's some of that there but really the the big trick was how do you capture that and for example how do you capture some of the things that got lost mm -hmm. over the years that kind of got polished away over time, like the etherealness of the Fae, right? Yeah. How you make them a little strange and almost a little scary at times, mm -hmm. where you're like, they're this far left of what you expect them to be, right. right? And understanding the world around them. And yet they're still good guys, right? They're not yeah. enemies. So that, I think that was the hardest part, because I mean, it's, it is really tough. The simplest things that you don't notice are the things that took us the most time to, to put together. It sounds like you were pretty thorough in it, though, um, you know, really dissecting everything uh, down to the currency, to the like the the specific geography, like you, you yeah. put a lot of thought into it, it sounds like. Um, yeah, now, absolutely. Have you started expanding outside of that into other portions of your world at all? Yeah, we have, actually. And um, uh, do we get a sneak peek? Too much. What's that? <laughs> do we get a sneak peek here? <laughs> I mean, to be fair, we've not only expanded expanded outside of, of this area, but the work, because this work has been going on for years, yeah. it's actually expanded, say, beyond this world, mm -hmm. you know, because one of the core elements of this world is that um, humans, um, in an effort to make them not just be the, the average boring race that everyone plays, right? Yeah. Humans are from another world. They're not from Ataltis. Humans, yeah. Shabbat... Uh, Orogs and Nuwarden all came through a gate and first settled on a Taltus and became a dominant species because they came to help everyone be better. A story we've all heard before, like, don't you want to be just like us? We're so great, right? And it did not necessarily endear them to everyone. But then the gates collapsed in a cataclysmic explosion, trapping them all there. And so now you have these people who have to find a way to make this world their home and interact with the people that they've been interacting before from a position of power to a yeah. position of, we're all in the same playing field now, right? Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, as a result, we've already introduced the fact that, you know, a Taltus isn't all that there is. You know, there's more right. beyond it. And there are people who are desperately trying to get beyond. In fact, there's actually a clue to some of this in the book already, but I people are going to have to find, it. I don't want to give it away. You know, but there's <laughs> hints in there that people will start to find and be able to start to piece together how these things fit together. Nice. Sort yeah. of the secret story. That's awesome. Um, yeah. I'm really excited about it. I, like I said, I haven't read the whole thing. Uh, I've read like, Oh gosh, of the 
Game Master's Guide or done. I think it's Game Master's Guide. Uh, I've went through most of that. The definitely gone through the whole players one, and I, I love what yeah. I, I've seen in there. I haven't read it cover to cover, but I've skimmed through. Uh, really like what I've seen. Um, the the thing I was going to ask you that uh, I didn't necessarily get a good beat on because uh, I didn't <laughs> again spend as much time into it. What is the exact tech level like if you had to compare it to like the real world? Um, yeah. Where where is it at with that? We're talking about uh, sort of Roman era to okay. perhaps touching on Renaissance scenarios, right? Okay. For example, the halflings of the Dale Lands, they love to read. And so they've developed an, a very early uh, print, printing press. Now, it's not movable type. It doesn't work well. There are people who are against it because they say it takes the magic out of the, the work. How dare you do this instead of handwriting it? That's the only way you transfer the real yeah. essence of the story. But the halflings are are doing this thing. So there's the hints of this there. There's a suggestion of something called uh, storm powder, which okay. is this explosive element, which is a extremely volatile gunpowder. Uh, at some point, we'll introduce more of this. But we in play testing, one of the fun things about it is that it's a bit terrifying right. because right. you just don't know what's going to happen, which is Really, the consequences, right? It is, and yeah. and it, it kind of fits with what the early stories about gunpowder were, mm -hmm. were that the rest of the soldiers wouldn't stand near the guys with the guns because half the time the gun would explode and kill the guy with the gun and anyone nearby. Yeah. And so that's that's what I wanted because I also want from a from a meta game perspective, you don't want guns to take over. That changes the entire set, right? Right. But it's it's still nice to have that hint in there. And there's like dwarven grenades that are basically a mug filled with this storm powder with a top slapped on and a wick and they <laughs> chuck it right so it's like you got this beer stein uh, grenade that they throw right but <laughs> yeah, it, you got to be pretty desperate right it's one of those things it's kind of like casting a spell that's beyond you it's like you can do it yeah you sure that you sure that's what you want to do right oh no cool. doubt i want to do that now <laughs> just hearing like a stein that's got a cap and <laughs> like the flavor alone makes me want to do it. I don't care about the concept. <laughs> Friendly fire, sure. <laughs> we we had a, a guy playing a dwarf who was really into storm powder, yeah. and like his eyebrows are burned off and his beard is all curled and singed because he's always like blowing stuff up. And oh, everyone's like, well, dude, you just need to stay away." You, the you fan art, right. the fan art alone of that <laughs> just draws itself. <laughs> yeah. It's so you know, comic strips of that. <laughs> but but that stuff is all very cutting edge, right? They're not they're barely touching that. I don't intend to really advance into sure. that at any time in the setting because mm -hmm. I still want to capture that sort of classic medieval fantasy. Yeah. Where it's swords and shields and mm -hmm. spells. So no, stuff. don't have to worry about like any trains or anything like that. No, absolutely um, not. No. no air travel, really? No, but there are rumors about the Sky Riders of Lorel, the goddess of wind, okay. and that they have these these great floating devices with baskets Flyers underneath that something. they oh, fly okay. around, right? Um, and there are also rumors of flying vehicles from the Age of Magic. Before okay. the, the gods put a limitation on magic, which I guess is one important thing to point out, yeah. there's a few things that just don't work, such as teleportation. Because oh. after that queen screwed up the entire Elian Wilds and mm -hmm. almost killed everybody, and they looked around and said, oh my god, people should not have magic. Yeah. And the whole reason they had it is in Drorin, who is now the Lord of Darkness, gave it to them as a gift, and everyone was pissed at him. They're like, no, I'd be angry at him. And said, no, dude, you got to, no magic. That's, <laughs> we told you not to give them magic. Look what happened. We're casting right. you out. And he's like, great, cast me out. Well, we'll see how you like it now. But at any rate, during the Age of Magic, there were flying cities and all sorts of nice. things. But when the gods cast a ritual of limitation, cut the magic, and it eliminated most of those. But there are rumors that some still exist somehow yeah. avoided destruction so so the gods are very real in your setting yeah yeah now do they uh ever get involved like um with the in the in the books itself obviously what you do at your table is yeah. its own thing but in the history of it and stuff like that do they ever mingle and step foot on the material plane so they do However, it's not obvious, right? Okay. There are, it's more of a, I once heard that Toltrin showed himself to this king. Yeah. And it's more one of those things that it, it's a little hard to believe, or but it's enough there that people can believe it. But they do know they're real. 
right? right? So it's not really belief. I think that's an important difference. It's more of a Roman era, mm-hmm. you know, if it's not faith, they're just our bosses and we right. make them happy and they take care of us. Yeah. Um, but so they don't necessarily interact directly. More often you'd interact uh, with venturing party with a, one of their avatars yep. because there's over 300 avatars that serve the gods that are sort of angelic, like divine yeah. beings that serve them in different ways. Mm-hmm. And so in the world, no, you're not really going to, unless you want to do it at your game table, which would give people a way to do, but it's generally not the gods are walking around, but everyone knows that after the whole mess with magic, uh, the gods and the age of darkness that came after that, when the gods weren't paying attention, mm-hmm. now they pay close attention. And they still walk the world around us. And so people are likely to encounter them, but they might not realize it till later. The old man with one eye who you think is nobody you later discover was Zabos, you know, yeah. messing with you or talking to you about it. And, you know, one of the things that we're going to be coming out with that our backers are going to get in the next few weeks um, are divine favor cards, mm-hmm. which are or divine inspiration, which is a sort of an expansion of the inspiration rules that lets you actually play role play the gods. Oh, cool. Where by playing these cards, you sort of have the world shift a little bit to your favor, but in ways that you can't quite put your finger on it and say, that was, the gods did it. You could say that really, a true believer is going to know, but other people could still have a bit of doubt, but it lets you actually change the story. They're sort of fate cards, right? Change the story a little bit. And the fun thing is that if players around the table have the same God, they can add them together for a more powerful effect. Mm. Right. So at the at the party's like, oh, we're in big trouble. And everyone goes, I have a Grefkin card and I've got a Grefkin six. I got a Grefkin three. One goes, put them in, man. We need the best thing we can pull out at this point. Right. Yeah. And so it allows you to sort of role play that the heroes are something more that the gods at least have a peripheral interest or perhaps they're at least working towards what the gods want. And as a result, the universe guides them along a little bit. So it almost is like an incentive for actually choosing a god to follow then yeah because here's the thing is that if you have a patron anaros they're called the anaros you've got a patron anaros you can keep your cards from session to session for that anaros oh cool and so that's one of the benefits of it in fact there's a we have a grace system where you actually gain points of grace with the different anaros Mm -hmm. based on your actions and that also can be used as a way to supplement how you're using those divine inspiration cards Nice. And so it's kind of a cool way to, the, again, one of the ideas is that I felt like the gods got hand waved away as unimportant so often in games. Oh, and for you, sure. I, 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 I've played so many games where half the group doesn't even know who they're, they worship. Exactly. But yeah. this gives you a way for it to matter. And it yeah. matters as a story concept. Mm-hmm. And it also introduces some slightly old school things where as a cleric, if your grace isn't high enough, you lose your powers. Right. And so you create a system under which they can be like, well, you better do a little more here. You get more points at each level with your patron Anaros. And that also allows you to do more powerful and cooler things with your character mm-hmm. in, as you go up in level because you're, they're paying more and more attention to you. Right. Yeah. The, the one thing I was also going to say that I, I'm a big fan of random roll tables. I make random mm-hmm. roll tables all the time for like, not all the time. I, I've got like 20 I've made for my patrons and stuff. But um, big fan of them. And I noticed in the player's handbook, uh, I'm pretty sure it was there, there were a ton of them. I was like going through them like, oh my gosh, pages and pages. This is amazing. (laughs) I love this. Um, So I I can't wait to actually spend a lot more time looking at those more in depth. But um, do you you care to elaborate on those? Like, I think there's like your mishaps table was great, obviously. Yeah. Uh, But there is a ton of tables. how, do you just sit there and like just think, oh, I need to make a random table. I'm going to and just sit there for 30 minutes and make a table? Or Well, there's a, sometimes that's exactly what I do. <laughs> um, you know, one of the reasons there's all the tables in the player's guide, I'm just looking at the yeah. book here to just sort of, yeah, like all of these sort of character yes. background tables. So I'm not a big fan of the four. The bonds, ideals, flaws. Yeah, and stuff. Yeah, you I'm like more fan. nuance into it. I like more nuance and I like something that's not so repeated. You know, you see the same thing come up again and again. Yeah. And I like something that's a little bit richer. And so what I did is within this, I created a thing where there are certain questions like, if you want to use these, your life as a child, lived alone on the streets, were extremely rich, 
uh, believed you were someone else. You know, yes. these little things that can create story hooks for you. And that's mm -hmm. the key thing is that each one of these is a story hook. And then you can go on to when the adventure begins, you have a good friend who's a cleric. Uh, you're a lycanthrope are dead because you were crushed by a runaway wagon on your way to your first adventure create a new character um <laughs> yeah there's only one of those but i couldn't resist folks who have played some older systems like battle lords mm. will reckon and traveler will recognize the you die during character creation so you can die in character creation on this oh yeah, yeah. oh that is great yeah, so dude, is, when, the, when the adventure begins you're i dead. love that so i've never <laughs> played traveler i do have the starter set for it which you can't die in character creation on the starter set i don't think. yeah um but that was always the selling point. Like ever, that's all I ever heard of Traveler, and I've never heard that in another game. I'm sure it's out there, but yeah. now hearing this, I am even more excited to. Make I mean, people the use odds are super slim, right? It's, <laughs> it's no fun to have that happen all the time, but right. it's there. If you with the that's right great. rolls at the wrong time, you could end up going. And he died getting hit by a wagon on the way to the first adventure. But yeah. see, then you can immortalize that dead character that never even made it to session one in the campaign. It's great. Well, that's exactly <laughs> it, right? And that's the whole point of this is how do people describe you? What matters to you yeah. most? What are your memorable traits? Like the thing that when somebody says, did you ever meet that person? What's the first thing they say yes. about you? Yes. Right? Yes. They, they look at you and they say like, uh, oh, that's the guy who talks to himself all the time. Right? Yes. Those are the sorts of hooks that I wanted to give people because yep. especially when you first make your character, there's such this sort of breaking in phase where it's hard yeah. to sort of like learn who they are. And I love tables like this that give you ideas, right? You can Me too. ignore them, you can pick from them, you can roll on them. But if you just, don't like it, roll again or pick something. That's exactly it, right? Yep. Like I'm a I'm a hardcore random guy. I'm a guy who'd roll all his stats yep. every single time just because I love to sort of see where I land. Yeah. But uh you know, it absolutely is a way just to help you to build that character up front so you know who they are. It forces you out of your comfort zone. Like, I am somebody that, without random roll tables, I can sit, like, I'll sit there and play martial classes all day. And they'll, it'll be a, not vanilla, but it'll be a human. Like, that's just kind of what I gravitate to naturally, just because I identify with it. And it's like, all right, this is what I'm going to play. Almost every new system I play, it's always going to be a fighter, usually a human, so on and so forth. But I do have, like, random roll dice for, like, classes and, like, you know, your race. Like, I use yeah. those now. I try to force myself out of my comfort zone. And so having random tables like that, perfect. Beautiful. Genius. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so, yes, some of them we just sit down and write. Other times yeah. I put them up and all the guys in my game group, I'm like, I want as many of these ideas as you yes. can, and then you pick through them. So I do give a hat tip to the gaming group for some of the uh, very clever ones that are in there. That's great. You know, things like you discover you're not who you thought you were your whole life. It's like, oh, that's oh, a good God, What a story hook for you at the start of yeah. the game. That's awesome. It, like inspiration in any form, I'm always looking for it, whether it's world building stuff. Like, again, I, I, that's my that's my jam, as I like to say. That is my jam. Yeah. So. That's great. Um, so I, I, we're about 45 minutes in, so I do yeah, want to yeah. shift a little bit. We'll probably come back because Ataltus is really cool. Um, how did you get into the gaming industry specifically? Like, I, I know you've done a lot of writing. Were you always mm -hmm. a writer? Um, so I actually had decided that, you know, I was like, I'm going to make my own game. It's what I want to do, right? So I went to Gen Con and I started looking for ways to become a better game designer. And I ended up going to the Writers Symposium, yep. which folks who don't know for about 25, 30 years, it was an event where writers would talk to people who want to be writers. And I was like, well, I can at least learn how to write better. And so I started, I'll probably say all sorts of me learn how to write good. Um, <laughs> Um, so I started going to these and I started really liking writing fiction. It's part of why I did an anthology is because I think fiction is such an important part of our gaming universe. Yes. Right? And so I started writing and I ended up fortunate enough to be able to get some short stories published over time. And for example, I actually got to write some short fiction for Shadowrun, right? Mm -hmm. I got to write some, work on some Shadowrun books as well. And I wrote an article for Dragon Magazine once back in the day. And, you know, I got to do some of these things where I got to start playing in these worlds and getting to explore what it's like. And so from, you know, that was really where I started from. I also got to meet a lot of incredible people, right? Yeah. Like through running the Writers Symposium, which I eventually ended up running. I guess that's the 
it's part of the story I didn't tell is eventually I drove the bus, right? Um, yep. It's like I got to meet folks, like I got to hang out with folks like Ed Greenwood and Elaine Cunningham and Dave Gross and all of these amazing, I could, can't even name all, Matt Forbeck and Bruce Cordell and everybody. Yep. Um, all these amazing people who I wish I'd go back to high school self and say, dude, <laughs> Jeff Grubb and, and Stan, you hung out with them. Like, you know, the guys <laughs> who worked on the games you played every day in high school. You're right? going to go out and have beers and eat dinner and, you know, yeah, have all sorts of adventures with these guys. It's bonkers, yeah. right? Yeah. But what it did is it helped me to start to see the industry, right? Yeah. And it kind of gave me a view into how the industry functions and how it works. Yeah. And so a lot of this for me is not just the creative effort, but it's how do I add to the industry as a whole? How do I build a business model that is supports creative people in doing amazing, cool things, yeah. pays them the right amount, pays them on time, and, you know, yeah. all these sorts of things as well. So that's how I got into it. It was just, you know, started with my desire to be a game designer and then accidentally becoming a fiction writer and then getting back into gaming. And then here I am today with a tall so. what, what was the very first uh, thing you actually published? The A Dragon Magazine article. I think it was oh, Dragon okay. 322. And it was one of my favorite tips as a game master, which is the third time's the charm, which is about when you're running a mystery game, mm -hmm. the third thing the party try just decides to check that's it. is that's always the right I've, choice i've seen that and i don't remember who wrote it but now you know. yeah it's and it works <laughs> great because the first time you're like no oh it's a dead end that's not the guy like, maybe the killer is this guy Swerve. no that's wrong too and then they sit there and usually if the second one they're frustrated they're like yeah. i don't know anymore they go wait a second and they go running to this third person. You're like, oh, you caught me. And they're all like, yeah, we're so smart. This is yes. great. Because mysteries are hard to run. Half the time you write a mystery and everyone just goes, I can't find the clues, dude. We, we right. can't, right? Yep. That, so like, I, that was, I'm terrible at like solving puzzles and mystery. I am awful at it personally. Yeah, and it's hard to write them so people can right. find them from a gaming. So that was my first thing. Yep. An article for Dragon Magazine. That's awesome. I would have had something for Earth Dawn, but I was... 19 years old and i wrote it for uh lou prosperi and sent it to him he, he was super nice wrote me back like two pages of notes oh wow and i looked at those notes and went oh he thinks i'm awful mm. and i threw them away you and didn't i didn't know though you didn't know how I the industry know. works yeah <laughs> it's awful so i've it, tried to start so many things i just have never finished them <laughs> yeah <laughs> but but like as being younger when i did most of those things like again it was like oh this isn't even any good because I've learned recently in talking to people in the industry, it's like, get yeah. your ideas on paper till you're finished with it. Don't worry about the quality until you have it all down and then go through and like fine tune the details and quality. And so now I'm able to like do that a little better. Like I've started working on my own system. I've got like 70 pages written, you know, oh, nice. and like, you know, will it ever see the light of day? I don't know, but I'm having fun doing it. You know, my homebrew world, I've started doing the same kind of thing. So I love stuff like, like one, going to seminars, learning from people like yourself. Uh, I think I've seen you speak in like five or six different ones at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but I love that stuff. Um, if somebody is thinking about getting into uh, the industry, what would you yeah. recommend to them uh, if they're watching this right now? Uh, I think the biggest thing that I would recommend is to be realistic about what the industry is, right? Mm -hmm. the, the reality is that very few people make make a living doing this, right? I work a day job. Yep. Every single person working on Ataltis works a day job, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I should say Sean, who does our layout, and Russell right now are doing their work full time, but not just Ataltis. They're doing yeah. contract work and things out there. Yep. So yep. most of us, though, end up working a job because you're just not necessarily, the odds are against you, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, right? You do it because you love it, because of the excitement of it, the yes. joy of giving something back to that community that has given you so much over the years. Yes. And if you're lucky, you'll catch, right? And, yeah. It's like, you don't become a musician because you're gonna be a rock star. You become a musician yeah. who <laughs> loves music and yeah. maybe you'll become a rock star. Same thing yeah. here. So that would be my first advice. But the other thing is to go out and talk to the different companies, look at their website, look at their submissions policies, there are tons of opportunities and you know if you follow through and you do good work and you deliver it on time yeah. you have a chance to to be part of this right you're already going to be ahead of most everybody else by just 
following through and delivering on time. And, you know, it's just and that's the and hardest it. part. It's it's making sure that you finish things in a timely manner. Right. Like that's yeah. probably the hardest part about this, especially when like in a lot of cases you're doing it because you're going to submit something. There's no actual deadline. Yeah. And so you have to force enforce deadlines on yourself. Like, I, and I say that from someone who's done like remote work in the past where you kind of have to be on yourself and hold yourself mm-hmm. accountable at times. So, yeah. Yeah. It's tough. And I, I think though, that at the end of the day, the people who are successful in this industry mm-hmm. are the ones who deliver and deliver with regularity and yeah. deliver good work on time. And that's really the thing that makes the difference in the end. Yeah, definitely. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so the the Gen Con Writers Symposium, yeah. you were in charge of that. Uh, not, I don't think you are anymore, right? You, but you were up until yeah. very recently, a couple of years ago. I was in charge for about five or six years, maybe seven. I don't remember exactly <laughs> anymore. And then I passed the torch to a couple of other people, Melanie Metters, who was editor on the Ataltus Projects, okay. um, and Kelly Swales. And they took over for a few years. And then recently they ended the program in its current incarnation. Oh. And so it it was sunsetted. However, Gen Con is reviving it. And there's a group of people working to bring back a new writer's track. So that gotcha. just let folks know it's coming back. But yeah, I did run it for years. I took over from Gene Raby, who had ran it for over 20 years. And then, uh, you know, at a fantastic time, it was an amazing opportunity. I mean, I had dinner with Terry Brooks. So uh, <laughs> my life was complete then, right? I mean, uh, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've had a lot of bucket list items, it sounds like. Oh, my God. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. I'm just really fortunate. Well, things have yeah. really worked out well for me. But I also haven't quit, right? Like, I started right. 20 years ago. Yeah. At least more than 20 years ago. So, I mean. And you seem just as enthusiastic now as you probably were 20 years ago. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> even more so, right? I mean, it's so much work, but it's just, yeah. it's a beautiful thing to be part of. What are some of the uh, your favorite IPs or maybe not even necessarily IPs, but like what have been your bucket list items that maybe you've scratched off the list that maybe you've gotten a chance to work on over the years? Yeah, so Shadowrun was one of them. I okay. loved uh, especially the Fossa years of Shadowrun and Earthdawn. Those two settings were just like huge for me. And I yeah. loved being able to be a part of that and being able to contribute to that setting, right? Yeah. I wrote chapters for uh, a novel that's out. I did short stories. I got to submit things to um, the Shadowrun Almanac and did some editing on that as well. And, you know, being able to work on that after all the years that me and my chummers spent, you know, racing around in our souped up cars with our, uh, uh, with uh, our, cyberware and our deckers and our magic users you know it's just awesome to contribute to that um but earth dawn i loved right it's a big inspiration for this as well because earth dawn had such a rich story behind it right mm-hmm. the story of earth dawn was just so powerful to us that i looked at that and went that's how you can do it you take the things everyone's used to yeah but then you wrap it in a story that is different but familiar and you yeah. can create a fantastic setting from that and so that was one of my inspirations along the way. Of course, I'm a huge, I, I should say I'm a huge Marvel superheroes fan. The Same. old Marvel superheroes game, love it. We played it a few, a uh, couple years ago and it was every bit as awesome as we remembered it, you know. <laughs> uh, but of course, you know, Forgotten Realms, Greyhawk. I mean, yeah. all the classics like, you know, I mean, to be fair, Heroes of Thornwall and Dunbury Castle are if, it's essentially my love letters to Hamlet, Hamlet and keep on the borderlands, right? Yes. It's sort of like a modern incarnation of those ideals. Which We're actually think- playing keep on the borderlands. I've played, I've played keep on the borderlands like three times. I've never completed it as a player, by the way, mm-hmm. but we're playing it right now. Uh, we've taken a hiatus. It's coming back this Friday um, with my friend, uh, Bill from roll stats. He also is uh, helping me on my website and stuff, but um, I, I'm so excited. I'm playing like a three hit point character and, like, <laughs> and he's supposed to be a fighter. Like I've got the heavy right. armor, but the whole time, because I got three hit points, I'm like, I'm in the back shooting a bow, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I love it. Like, oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Sorry. So, I mean, those sorts of things are, no, it's all right. Because that's, that's it, right. Those are the things that inspired us. And that's kind yes. of what, you know, the stuff we've written for Ataltus is very new. It's got a, yeah. it's very different, but it does touch on some of those points yeah. that 
we can remember. I mean, and the thing is, is that Keep on the Borderlands is cool, not because it's Keep on the Borderlands, yeah. because it's this concept of that fortress standing on the edge of a dangerous world. Yes. The only thing standing between the, the good people on one side and the evil forces on the other. Mm -hmm. And that's such a powerful ideal, right? It's such a yeah. powerful idea. It's, it comes from our own history. And, you know, I wanted to capture that. And, you know, here's a thorn wall. Part of what I wanted to capture there was the idea that you're not just fighting. And Ataltus is the big part is that you're not always throwing the ring into the volcano, right? Yes. A lot of times the, the focus of an Ataltus adventure is saving the butcher and his family, right? Yep. The, yep. the idea is that you are making a difference in the world when no one else can. Yes. That it feels you like you're impacting the day-to-day -day lives to the NPCs and it's, yeah, it's a huge exactly yep. right, and I mean the rules support that that we've put in, like the goodwill rules, the setting yep. materials that we have support that because that's when it matters, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's it's in a lot of ways it's way cooler to have everyone in a small town throw the characters a feast than yeah. it is to get a medal pinned on by the local captain of the guard, right? That's like, oh, metal, yay, as opposed to everyone going around <laughs> telling the characters, we love you, you're the best. Yeah, the whole, like, festival and everything is awesome. Exactly, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's really cool. And so that's really important to me in those things. Nice. So with um, with the cool stuff you've worked on and yeah. everything, uh, moving forward, let's put this into the yeah. universe. Is there anything in the future you would love, that you would fanboy over, if you got to work on moving forward that you're now going to pursue by the way because we got to put this into the universe okay okay you mean <laughs> things that um that you haven't yet uh, okay do you mean other people's ip then, sure. or other people's my, ip my, yeah I mean, uh games movies whatever video uh, yeah. tabletop rpgs even i mean you've already kind of done a lot in the industry yeah so admittedly most of the things that i would love to work on today are the things that are related to my own project, I have to say. That right? works. Because the reality is that Ataltus is actually part of an overarching story yeah. that spans thousands of years and multiple worlds. And oh, I, I really hope that I've given the opportunity to tell people that story, right? Yes. Because that's it's a story that I would love to tell. And I'd love to tell it in a way that isn't just words on the page like a novel, but is yeah. an interactive experience where people can be part of it yes. and live that storyline from one end to the other. I feel like that's relatable. Cause like, if I had to think about it, like some of my favorite fandoms, like I would rather make my own homebrew world a thing, you mm -hmm. know, like five, 10 years from now, than probably like writing for star Wars or something, you know, like yeah. dude, that would be cool. But like, I don't know, I feel like having my own thing in the world and hearing people enjoy it is way more rewarding, probably. Yeah, well, and I guess the thing is that the reality, reality hits me a little bit too hard when I start talking about like, I'd love to write for Marvel. I'd love oh, to sure. write for, for, for Star Wars, for Lucasfilm. Yep. But the reality is that that's a very specific type of work, right? Yes. It's not the type of creative, I mean, there is creative storytelling there, yeah. but there's a lot of guidelines. There's a lot yeah, of approvals of, and rewrites just yeah. because they want little things tweaked. And then they and it's worth it, right? They, they end up with yeah. something really cool in the end. But the yeah. truth is, and I would not say no, if they came to me and said, Mark, would you write a Star Wars story? I'd be like, uh, yes. We yes, do I know would. a guy who's <laughs> working on the Marvel RPG next year. Oh, yeah. Matt I know. Thorbeck. Uh -huh. Hello. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> and I think that's, it would be super cool, but I really do like have this story that I, I would love to get out into the world and share yeah. with folks and give them the sort of memories that I've gotten from the realms and Greyhawk and, and all the rest. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, so your own homebrew game. So I've seen your yeah. game room in pictures before. You have an amazing yeah. looking game room. I'm so <laughs> jealous. Like my room is pretty big, but it's not as cool. Like I've got a 23 by 13 foot room and I want it bigger. <laughs> um, uh, I think you have a whole basement. I think when we I do. Well, most of it is game room. The other part is star Wars toys. So, and yeah. GI Joe toys. See, so. that works. I, I've got, <laughs> I've got my nerdy, like I've got a couple sports things. Cause I'm also a sports fan, but I've got like a, a pro wrestler up here. Like I've got some other stuff too, but, um, so your gaming group or gaming groups, I don't, how many do you have? How often do you play? What are you guys playing right now? All right, so I am in a single group at the moment, and we play every week. 
Now, I, I was doing two. One of the groups I played with were my nieces and nephews and my daughter. Yep. And we had a blast. Yep. And we played a variety of different fifth edition adventures yep. over the course of the pandemic and just had a great time doing it. They're, yeah. they're all like, you know, under 13, except my daughter, who's the oldest, and she's 16 now. But I mean, we just had a great time and they were amazing players. You know, the energy they brought to the game yes. was, you, you, you play for 30 years with the same guys, it's not this, it, you, you kind of fall into to habits. Yeah. But you get a bunch of new players on the table. And so that was a great game. And I do plan to pick that up again at some point. But I also play in a weekly game with the same guys I've been gaming with since college. Oh, that's but awesome. We've been gaming since college. We I'm jealous playing. of that, by the way. I've never gamed with someone that long. So. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's just been great. It's a fantastic experience. We're playing remotely still right now yep. over Zoom. But most of us are here in town near Ann Arbor. Yeah. And so we normally play in person. Did you go and to U of M, by the way? Or I did. I went to University oh, okay. of Michigan. Yeah. Oh, man. You and Matt went to my dream school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I just stayed after, right? I just That's didn't awesome. leave. Yeah. Um, so what are we playing? Right now, we've been playing Dungeon of the Mad Page. Oh, okay. Although, uh, just because we wanted to try Do it Do you out. like running modules or playing in modules? Yes and no. I like trying them because I always think that it's I'm going to love it. And then once I start playing it, I'm like, going, ah, I want to tweak it right yeah. and as, as a game master i struggle to play it as written yeah um so we're playing a little bit of that right now but we've played a lot I and mean, we've played savage worlds we played star frontiers i've got a yeah. stack of games over here cyberpunk <laughs> and call of cthulhu and you know uh, all the quests quests of yore you know from oh the, yeah 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 i mean stuff we want to play so yes. the witcher all sorts of things we want to try so we tend to play something for usually these days a few months Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe up to six months. To do you do. try to do like shorter story arcs and then wrap it up? Or do you just eventually it just fizzles out and you just try something different with them? Yeah, we just keep playing until one day we wake up and go the game master because there's a couple other guys who GM for our group. It's not always me. And yeah. someone goes, you know what? I really want to run Numenera. How do you feel about switching? Everyone goes, yeah, I'm game to switch. Let's do it. Right. Yeah. We play Numenera for a while. Right. Which is a great game, by the way. Um, it is. I've, I've played that once and I enjoyed it. It's been like five years, but uh, Monty yeah. Cook Games does a good job over there with Cypher System. And we'll jump in and do one shots too. Like I ran an Alien, yep. the starter set for the, yes. for the guys the other day, which by the way is great run remotely because you've okay. got people like screaming over the comm, help, I'm dying here. And you get this whole Alien sort of feel to it. So <laughs> a lot of fun. That's cool. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I like trying a bunch of games, but I usually don't have groups that want to. Luckily, uh, in the last five years, thanks to my YouTube channel, I've met a lot of people online. So I've been playing online since before the pandemic, and I've been able to play so many games in the last five years. Before that, because again, I was a big Palladium fan, I struggled to find people to play like Heroes Unlimited, Rifts. I really struggled for years to find groups for that. But if I wanted to go play D&D &D at college or whatever, people were always up for that. And even Pathfinder yeah. a little bit. Uh, about seven years ago. Um, but yeah, the last few years, like we've played games like that, like New Monera I've played. Uh, just recently, I've started to get into Call of Cthulhu. Mm -hmm. um, we've been playing that campaign for like a year now. And I think we're up to like episode 37 on the channel. Um, and we're going, that's probably going to end in like February. We have like 50 some episodes that the keeper has planned. And yeah, because uh, we're tr like, we're just, he just structured it out, I guess, at the beginning. But Love it, love it, love it. Um, but yeah, like trying new games. And the thing about it for me has been learning about my play style. Like my play mm -hmm. style has evolved a lot, I think because of the different systems I've played in the gaming groups. But uh, I've been playing with the same core group for a couple years now, which is kind of cool. And, and then we have games with like my family. And then I've started running games for my daughter and my, my six-year-old son. Um, my wife's a gamer. She actually got me away from Palladium and into D&D. &D. So like, not that mm -hmm. I gave up Palladium, but like D&D &D was not a thing I actually cared about until yeah. I met my wife. And now I'm like, oh, let's try all the games and let's play everything. She created a monster. <laughs> well, I'm secretly, uh, 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 I started with first edition, yep. AD&D, &D, and I'm still a first edition AD&D &D fan. Yeah. I, I, would, I would still play that today if the guys yep. would let me. They will not. <laughs> um, after we played Hackmaster Fourth Edition yep. one time, they said, "We've done it for you. you we're not going to do it anymore. <laughs> we need to stop." Uh, but yeah, it's, Mutant Year Zero is something we played that we okay. love recently. Just very yeah, cool. that's old school rules, right? 
No, no, Mutant Year Zero oh, it's is not? a newer game. Um, mm-hmm. It's actually very cool because it's mm-hmm. the entire book and game is built around a single adventure. Okay. Which I just love the idea of that, a game, a game dedicated to an adventure. And then, of course, they yeah. expanded out some additional things from there. But yeah. the core idea of leaving your mutant uh, post-apocalyptic home to find Eden. This what's mysterious what's the foundation of, like, the mechanics? How does the mechanics work in that? Yeah, so with the, the, the mechanics are relatively simplified from mm-hmm. the point of view that I'm going to get it wrong. I don't want to speak <laughs> It, it, it's a relatively simple system that is more cinematic than crunch. Okay. It's not about minis on the board. It's not about uh, measuring distances. It's yeah. more about visiting hexes, encountering what's there, and using a relatively straightforward, simple system of dice mechanics to figure out those few moments when you need to know exactly what gotcha. happens. And that can be a ton of fun. I, mm-hmm. I love crunch. I love GURPS. But, I mean, that sort of thing just works so well for yeah. that sort of cinematic story adventure that I just love it. It's just great. Yeah. I, so I used to prefer crunchier games, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I don't know, It's it really feels like, again, the people I started playing with around like 2015 and some of the games we played, I've went away from that. And I think I prefer simpler games where I don't have to think about mechanics. So yeah. like naturally D20 systems, I don't have to think about mechanics because I'm so used to them, I think at this point. Yeah. I wouldn't necessarily say they're like rules light or anything, but like, I'm just used to them, right? Um, but like Palladium obviously is a little bit more crunchy. You know, you got like some weird rules and a lot of stuff there. Um, Pathfinder second edition, I would say is a little bit crunchier. I don't know if you've played Pathfinder second yeah. edition. Yep. Um, I like Pathfinder Second Edition. It's just hard for me as a DM to keep track of everything, I feel. Mm-hmm. Like. But as a player, I think it's really cool. I've only played it once, and I'm, I'm still trying to find people to run that uh, for me so I can play it some more. Because yeah. um, there's so many cool builds you can do with it. Because that's I feel like that's the other thing. With crunchier games, there's a lot of character options. Whereas yeah. simpler games, there's not. It's like left up to you to role play it out. And I kind of like having the mechanics for options as a as a player, but as a DM, I don't want really crunchy rules to run and adjudicate <laughs> things. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's I like a hard thing for thing me to find. Is if the crunch delivers a cool story. And right. I think that's key is that sometimes you've got crunch and you're just sitting there going, why am I wading through these rules? Yeah. It hasn't changed my story at all. Like one of the things that happened in <laughs> playing GURPS is for folks who don't know it's one second rounds and you know we had a buddy who started playing in fact there's a, a picture in one of the books that's an ode to him uh he <laughs> a wild boar in our first adventure comes charging at him he goes i'm gonna throw my bolo at it the game master goes awesome he goes all right i throw it he goes well you haven't drawn it he goes oh, okay draw it and then the boar is coming towards him he goes all right i throw my bolo he goes i'm gonna wind it up he goes, you gotta wind it up first he goes no and the boar is coming closer <laughs> And finally goes, I'm going to throw it. He goes, well, you haven't aimed it. He goes, son of a gun. And before oh. you know it, the boar is on him and it's goring him to death. And there's blood and death. And it, yeah. it, the reality is that it was hilarious. Yeah. And it added an element to the story. It changed the way we played the game. You know, games that have exhaustion. Then you find yourself like in Hero, hiding behind a wall, trying to catch your breath. Right. Yeah. And you're like, okay, I need to rest that adds to the story and i think that's the key thing is if the crunch adds to the story it can be a ton of fun but when it doesn't only when it's memorable stuff though if it if it's literally just tasking and it's like it feels like it or at least for me if it feels like it's getting in the way of the fun exactly then it's you know because i when i run like palladium for example i throw the rules out the window a lot of times as a gm like i'll let if someone really wants to do something like I kind of am like, okay, yeah, like, let's just do it, you know, and I'll leave it up to a die roll sometimes. But uh, I go outside the rules of that all the time. And I do it not as much with like D&D, for example, like, uh, I feel like the rules are a nice framework. It's pretty easy within the rules to pretty much do everything, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like games that are crunchy, which I do enjoy. Uh, again, I'll hand wave most of the stuff for the rule of fun all the time, if I can. Yeah, so, I, I think yeah. I would say that one of the games we played recently that was great was Savage Worlds. Okay. It, it's the right amount of the, the mechanics add to the story and tell the game. And at the same time, it doesn't get in the way of you having yeah. a great time playing it. And we actually used it to play test uh, a, a setting that we're working on. 
Oh, cool. And, you know, because we wanted a rule set that we could just sort of drop into it to see how yeah. the setting works. And it's a beautiful system, really elegantly designed. So. I'm actually, I'm talking with uh, Sean Robertson next week. Yeah, mm -hmm. 15th. Uh, he works for Pinnacle right now, mm -hmm. uh, but he's also a partner now at Palladium Books. And he was the one who did the Savage Riffs revised yeah. version. So I'm excited to talk to him about some of that. And 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 yeah, but um, yeah, we I've played Savage Riffs. I've played like, what was it? Shine Tar, uh, which is by mm -hmm. Joe Patrick Fannin, uh, which is a Savage Worlds setting. Yep. Uh, I've done the Supers Companion as well a little bit. Um, the rules, I, I think on paper, the rules are great for me. There's mm -hmm. just little things that take me out of it. Like, I don't like a deck of cards for the initiative. That kind of mm -hmm. like, yeah. it's just a whole separate thing that I don't think is necessary. You could do it with like, but that's just me. Uh, great game. And again, when I read it, I was like, oh, this is cool. I invested hundreds of dollars into <laughs> Savage Worlds because I was like, this is great. And I've, I've played it and I've given it so many chances. I just don't think certain things jive with me, but, or the wild die kind of takes me out of it a little. You know, just because yeah. now I'm keeping track of two sets of numbers. Something so little that shouldn't be distracting to me, but it is for some reason. But I know everybody exactly. I talk to loves that stuff. You know? Yeah, I, I just thought it played really well. We could pick it up. And from a, yeah. I guess also from a GM perspective, right? really easy for me to wing it. Yeah. Well, right. you don't have a wild die as a GM. Right. Unless no, it's a don't. boss, I guess. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah. But no, it's a cool, it is a cool little game. And I like how adaptable it is to multiple settings. Like, yeah. uh, like the, some of the settings I didn't get that I thought were cool was like the weird war ones, like one or uh -huh. two, those stood out to me. Uh, there's a few others. Um, there was like a one, I think it was like Rome or something like that. Like mm -hmm. that I thought was cool. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. They have some really cool things for Savage Worlds for sure. And a really dedicated fan base. So, yeah. 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 All right. Well, um, I think we're going to wrap up there, but I, I've really enjoyed this. I'm definitely going to have to have you on again sometime. Is there anything you have coming up that you're working on? Uh, you said a setting for Savage Worlds that you're working on. Yeah, well, I can't talk too much about any, any of that. It's not necessarily for Savage Worlds. It's where we play testing it. Yep. I actually kind of like the idea of, of using Savage Worlds. But there you, go. you know, I think the main thing right now is um, for Ataltus, we've got the five main books are out now. Yes. And the Champions of Ataltus, the anthology of short stories. So that's good. We're, we're the Forgotten Gate should be coming out probably this week sometime, which is a, okay. just a really short 32 page adventure. And so we'll have that coming up soon. Um, we also have a book called the Book of Days, which our backers yeah. have, but which is the Talton calendar and holidays. And so that's going to be coming out to the public pretty soon. The Divine Inspiration cards and of course, Game Master screen inserts. Uh, yeah. But we're also working on what's coming after that. And, you know, we're working on the next thing, adding some additional cultures that people can play, adding some additional monsters that people can dig into. Uh, really will those, will those cultures be also because you're expanding the world a little bit out? We're not going to go there yet. Because oh, okay. So it's still within so that. There's so much area. to talk about mm -hmm. just in the Amethyst Sea Basin that we've yes. only just touched on it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we've got this huge area that we can work with that we just, I still want to explore Salenfia and Port Vale and all these other sites that we've got the dragon's yeah. mall we've got a lot to work with here so far yeah. without going too far afield plus the thing is is that i want to give people stuff they can add on to their game mm -hmm. not stuff that they're like yeah this is great if my party at second level travels across the continent right i want something that's like here's the next town over here's what you can yeah. do yeah. Today with your well it adventure. makes it more rich that little area too you know and i, yep. I say little but the mediterranean is not that tiny i mean <laughs> well yeah, it's not little right but <laughs> right but I mean, if you start going beyond, I mean, when you start talking about the difference between, you know, if you're talking Mediterranean from Spain to Japan, it's not like your adventures are just going to pick up and say, let's go adventure over there for a while. Right. right. Yeah. Especially when the means of travel is not like airplanes and. You know. Right. And there's no teleportation on a tell this. So, yeah. you know, you, you can't just jump there. You have to walk right. or sail or something. So. That's but awesome. yeah, so we're just going to keep expanding that, putting out new content for that, expanding on Dunbury Castle and Thornwall, and hopefully start expanding on things like the Deeplings and Salenthia and getting some of these other areas built out for folks. Because putting out new content is super important to us. Because yeah. as a gamer, I always want something new to play with. So that's really where we're focusing is, is putting out a stream of new content for people. Awesome. Yes. And uh, where can people find Mark Tassin? Yeah, so the easiest place to find me and our stuff is on ataltus.com. 
It's uh, which you can find the spelling and probably the the pictures and things on the on the YouTube video. Um, we're also on Drive Through RPG. It's the only place you can get the books today, and you can get both the print and the PDF versions of the books there as well. Uh, and that's the best place to look for us. I mean, we're on yeah. Facebook. We've got a Discord channel. We've got you know Twitter and Instagram and all the usual good stuff. Yeah. But the easiest place to start is just start it in our website. You can. Find and everything. then branch out from there, yeah. Yep, any, yep. Whichever sort of social media platform is your thing, we, yeah. we'll be there for you. Uh, so with that, guys, uh, I do have the, again, the link to their drive through RPG to make the purchase. Uh, it does take you to the bundle, uh, so you could get everything mm -hmm. as a PDF. But uh, from there, you should be able to find the Ataltis, um store and find all the books if you want to buy the physical copies. Uh, when I will be reading th uh, through all the books here soon, uh, and I will be doing a review probably on each individual book uh, rather than a collective. I will probably do each individual book uh, as I finish them so you guys can actually get a more in-depth look into some of them. And maybe I'll do some flip-throughs as well for you guys so you guys can check them out uh, and see what the, the quality is of the actual books as well. Uh, so, yeah, thank you again, Mark. I appreciate it. And, hey, it's uh, been great. Oh, I, I always love talking to you. I, I mean, when we talked at Grand Con, I've always enjoyed it and love going to your seminars and stuff. And, oh, thanks. And are you back at physical conventions yet? No, I haven't been yet. Uh, in yeah. fact, I'm running, well, I am running a bunch of Ataltis games for UConn, which is yep. in Ann Arbor, but it's all virtual. So folks are looking to play some games. I'm running. Is that like an Ann Arbor address? Adventures. Pardon me? Is that Ann Arbor? I thought it was Ipsy. Well, it's, it's Ipsy, Ann Arbor. It yeah. says nobody Ann knows Arbor what Ipsy site, is. But it's, yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. So, so if folks are looking yeah. to play some games coming up in two weeks. I'm going to be running some adventures. It's all online and it's free. So That's this cool. year, but hopefully I, next I year, that. right. I want to be back in person next year. That's what I would yeah. love to do. Yeah. I'm, I would love to, um, but yeah, we could talk about that some other time, but yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, I'm probably not going to be back at physical conventions next year, unfortunately. Uh, I would love to. It's just probably not going to happen uh, unless things drastically change around the country. Um, yeah. But yeah. So anyways, guys, thank you for watching. Uh, again, subscribe. Give us a like. Check out his links below, ataltis.com. I post it in the chat. I will add that to the description for you guys below. Uh, and again, if you uh, go purchase from DriveThruRPG, I do get a little bit of a tiny commission and store credit on DriveThruRPG. So I won't be mad if you buy from there. Yeah, um, use his links. Yeah, use my links. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, and uh, we'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Great, bye.